Hello and welcome to Profiles in Risk with your host, Tony Canyas. And today I am really excited because today we get to talk insurance careers, which is my very favorite topic. Uh, so often I, I, I am hosting like insure tech conversations, uh, but insurance careers is really where my heart is. Uh, and today I have with me L. Michelle. L. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and I am very proud that I actually remember to ask you on the pronunciation. I very often forget to do that and end up butchering people's names. So, so L, thank you for, for joining me today. And L, L is with uh, Intelligent Intentions, or rather runs Intelligent in Intentions. Yes. And consultant, speaker, trainer, and, and coach in the insurance and risk management industry. And what, I, what, I, what I'm really excited about is, is you actually come from a significant career on the risk management side, which is exactly the part of, insu of insurance that, that I've never lived in. Uh, so I'm really, really excited to, to kind of hear your perspective. So, so but, but first, uh, I, I'd love to, to have you kind of tell your story. How, how, how did you end up in risk management and how did you end up moving from risk management to, to being a, a career coach? Wow, so it's an interesting story. I um, always loved numbers and math, and my mother did as well, and she was an accountant, so she thought uh, I was going to follow her footprints to be an accountant. Um, and then I took a couple of accounting classes in early high school, and, and it just didn't resonate with me, but I still, you know, appreciated math. And so fast forward, I took some AP math classes later in high school and learned about the um, beauty of projections, data analytics and things of that nature. So I, I was in love and I talked to my teacher and said, hey, you know, how, what career is aligned with this? And he told me actuaries and the whole insurance. So I had never heard of an actuary. So all mm -hmm. of this was new to me. So I understood, you know, actuaries and all these things. So fast forward, I go to college, attended Georgia State University, one of the top programs in the country. And I went down the path of being an actuary major and had an opportunity to do an internship for a day. Um, I love the math. I love the work. Um, but the environment was not conducive to my personality. So I went to my counselor and said, Hey, help me out. You, you, you know why it was not conducive to your personality? Because actuaries are not supposed to have personality. <laughs> well, you know, that's funny because at the time that was, the, that was the truth. But now <laughs> forward to 2020 where so many people and companies in particular are interested in data but not just interested in like spitting the numbers out but wanting to understand the data now actuaries are actually having to explain what they do and talk to people Co and be communication on skills yeah, and, right. and so skills. now they're required to have a personality whereas yeah. in 94 95 which is when you know i was um exploring these possibilities they were you're right they were absolutely not required to have um a personality and so when i observed the environment i was just like this is not <laughs> so, going to be work this is not going to work well for me so i went to my so, counselor so, so you went back to your counselor yeah go ahead went back to my counselor and said okay i love this world i think insurance is fascinating it touches every industry and there's job security because i didn't have parents who were going to take care of me for the rest of my life and they were very clear about that so i said okay what can i do and they said okay well risk managers are consumers of what actuaries produce often and they work with people a lot more and understanding the numbers and how it all works is beneficial and so changed my major to risk management and all my classes transferred so i don't have to start over <laughs> to the same department that was important mm -hmm. so here i am 25 plus years later um with um, a degree in risk management and insurance and a very colorful and interesting career in that space so you, I, I, I wasn't, no, I, I guess I was aware, but, but there were not a lot of people, like to this day, there's not a lot of people studying RMI uh, back in like 95. Uh, I, 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 I can imagine that, that this was a very small group. Yes, it was a very small, tightly woven group. Um, even at Georgia State being one of the top programs, it wasn't a whole lot of people that majored in risk management. And there's actually um, a business fraternity called Gamma Iota Sigma for risk management fraternities. It's a national organization. And I was a part of that. And as um, and part of our effort was going around school, recruiting mm -hmm. people and, and convincing them that they should change their major to mm -hmm. risk management. 
shirts. That, that, is, that is still uh, like that, that is still how Gamma works today. Now, uh, so you, you you were involved with Gamma in, in the pre Noel Cody Sporty days. I know Noel pretty well. Uh, so so I, I I I became aware of of of, uh, of Gamma only in the last few years, and I've been to their conference a couple of times. Uh, but but Gamma like like today Gamma is a monster. Like 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 it is a well organized, well oiled machine, and and Noel uh, is a uh, just a fantastic leader. But but back back in your day, like what I've heard is is that Gamma was basically. Uh, it kind of ran by the admin of of whoever the the the, the organization's current president one was, which rotated every year. There really wasn't much to Gamma at, at, at the time of the, at a national level. Uh, yeah, the- you're right. It kind of grew and evolved, and even on a local level, I mean, it only was as powerful as the people that supported it, um, as far as the professors and were able to administratively support it and financially support it. And I was blessed to have an amazing um, sponsor, Dr. Laura Lee Schneider. Now her name is Dr. Laura Lee Metters and she's at App State University. And she was an amazing advocate for Gamma Iota Sigma as an organization. And she really put forth some efforts to connect what we were learning in school, connect the curriculum to the career opportunity. So she was a great advocate and that made all the difference in the world. And I'm glad that Gamma Iota Sigma is growing and evolving to be um, more thoughtful about how they're connecting to their students. Yeah. No, Noel is, I, I, and I've never had her on the podcast. I really should. She's, she's a good friend. Uh, so, 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 so anyway, so, so you get to, to, to the end of your RMI degree and you graduate at, as one of the very few RMI majors in, in the, in the country, really. Uh, so, so, so where, where did you go at that point? So at that point, um, I knew that I wanted to be a risk manager. Um, I did an internship for a Southern company with um, Gary Meggs, who's an amazing career mentor, an amazing human being. Um, And so I did an intern there and I knew that I wanted to be in a similar role in a corporation in a risk management capacity, but there are no entry level positions for that. And so you don't come out of college and go straight into risk management. You kind of have to get some foothold in insurance in some kind of way. And so, is, is that still the case today? It is. And it's unfortunate. Well, it shouldn't say unfortunate. It's just interesting because in order to be a thoughtful risk manager, you need to have some understanding, in my opinion, about how business works, how insurance mm-hmm. works, how you know things work outside of that. So um, it's just the nature of, of the career. It's just part of the, the culture of the career. Okay. So, um, so, so w- where where do people generally start that end up at, at risk management? So in, in, in every other area of insurance. So what they'll do is they'll either become, go into a training program as an underwriter, a claims advocate. Um, a lot of the brokers will have um, programs where you can um, do, it's kind of like a residency where you kind of go into several different areas and explore what's interesting. Uh, and then the, determine what's interesting to you and you do that work. Um, so there are other areas other than actual risk management. There, there are lots of areas in the insurance industry that creates um, opportunities for training. So for me, my opportunities was with AIG. AIG had decided to close all the claims offices all around the country and only have two major claims areas for property and casualty. And that was um, Overland Park, Kansas and Alpharetta, Georgia. And Alpharetta is a suburb of Atlanta. And so when they moved the whole east, the, the east side of the country, all the claims were being managed in Alpharetta, Georgia, the year that I graduated from college. So lucky me. <laughs> so I was Atlanta lucky. Atlanta is, is, is a wonderful market for insurance professionals. Uh, my, my, my girlfriend and I moved to Atlanta side on scene because of that. We, we wanted to get back east and there's so, we, we kind of, pulled out the spreadsheets, did the research, and there's so much insurance work here, especially in Alpharetta. Uh, but but yeah, it's, it's just a wonderful insurance market. Yeah, Alpharetta seems to be the hub. And so AIG had a claims office up there. And, um, and thanks to my connection with RIMS, I had gone to a RIMS luncheon. And this gentleman um, who worked at AIG, George Miller, an amazing gentleman, um, an amazing human being all around, but he's been in the industry forever. He's now retired. And he said to me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to be a risk manager. And he said, well, in order to do that, you need to understand 
how things happen because we're in this business because shit happens, <laughs> right? And I'm like, well, yeah, that's, that's how it works. So he said, you need to understand what that looks like. And he recommended that I start in claims in order to understand how things happen on the back end so that on the front end, I could be a more thoughtful risk manager as far as placing insurance and understanding programming and protocol and processes and things of that nature. And he was absolutely right. Being um, a claims professional really gave me a different understanding of what I'm navigating then on the front end. Um, and so it was great. I went there with the intention of being there exactly one year for training. And one, and one year was it was enough? I was there. Yes, I, yes, it was because I. You have to remember a lot of people that are in insurance and, and claims and, and all areas of insurance. They don't go to school for insurance. They kind of learn on the That's job. Right. You, you had the RMI. And for me, I already had an amazing foundation mm -hmm. of a four-year mm -hmm. degree in risk management insurance. I already had a licensing course, which is a forty-hour course. Um, for licensing for claims and agency. So I, I felt pretty confident in understanding that, you know, I had seen a lot. Plus, I was managing a desk of um, about 350 litigated files on the East Coast from New York down to Florida. And I saw a lot in a day. So in a year, trust me, <laughs> I had that, seen a whole lot of examples. That, that, that is a, a big thing that I'm always telling people uh, when, when I'm, I'm giving career advice. And I give career advice in like one time, 30 minute, like quick, what I call micro mentoring. It's very different from, from what you do as a coach. Right. Uh, but I, I always tell people, uh, there, what, you want, like experience only comes with time but you want to put yourself in the place where you're getting the right experience, right? 15 exactly. years in, 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 you know, the, the, the state, the state farm call center handling the same auto claims over and over. Uh, it's not great experience, right? Uh, I totally uh, agree with you. I read a book that, that was, that, that gave a very interesting point. And I, I can't remember the name of the book right now, but I read a book that said, you know, most people say they have 10 years of experience when they really have one year of experience 10 times, you know, they've done the same thing over and over and over again. So then you really have 10 years of experience. Do you have one year of experience that you've lived, you know, in a space of 10 times? And I totally agree. So with, with claims, and they were, you know, they were complex claims. They were interesting. They were commercial. The fact that I had a degree, they didn't put me on like, you know, a quick desk. They put me on like a real Excellent. litigated desk. Yeah. So I'm managing, you know, fresh out of college, I'm managing attorneys and I'm, you know, redlining bills and I'm, you know, doing mediations and, you know, going through the process of litigation, not just paying claims. And so I had a broad range of um, work to do on my desk and decisions to make and, you know, rhythm of work. And so I, yeah, I felt like a year. Um, I, I didn't feel like um, I was going to gain anything more doing that over and over again. Uh, plus, I also earned my AIC while I was there. So that was a more education, more training. So, yeah, I felt like I, I call it my tour of duty <laughs> at AIG. Yeah. Like, I just feel like, you know, it was like well, a for my career. <laughs> AIG is, is not an easy company to work for. But the, the beauty of it is is you do get to see, like, big, hairy Yes. Ugly claims, right? <laughs> like they, because they insure yes. the hard stuff. Um, You're right. And not just the letter of the policy, but you understand the politics of the policy as well. And I think that's an important aspect that I really learned, you know, just not, you know, the letter of what's covered, what's not covered, but understanding the intention, the politics, the everything that comes along with the world of insurance. So it was a beautiful experience and I'm, I'm tremendously thankful for it. Excellent. Okay. So with, with that year of serious claims experience of, of like deep claims experience, uh, boot camp is a, is a, is a great way to put it. Uh, at that point you, you're like, okay, so, so now between the degree and this experience, I can, I can at least get started as, as an actual risk manager. Right. And so I had my eyes set on um, opportunities in the risk management industry from the beginning. You know, I tell my clients and people that I mentor, you can't start networking when you need something. For me in college, I was a part of um, RIMS. I went to all the lunchings. I connected with people in Atlanta. Atlanta insurance industry is a very small, tightly woven in, you know, cohort of people. So I, you know, always kept my eyes and ears open, let people know what I was looking for, what my intentions were. And that has been an amazing network for me. And so I learned um, 
of a of an opportunity that was at Turner Broadcasting, and they were positioning it as a um co- what's called a risk coordinator, which is as entry level as you're going to get in the risk management world. Okay. To go in to learn and be able to train as an analyst and get some meaningful experience, and so that was my next stop. Um, and when I got there, I learned that the position wasn't quite what it was sold to me to be. Um, and then I put my, you know, my ask out into the universe of RIMS um, community to say, you know, that I was looking for something more substantive. And so then Earthlink, the old school internet provider, moved from California to Atlanta and they moved the department with no people wanted to move to Atlanta. And so I had an opportunity to go over there to be a risk analyst. And um, that was perfect for a couple of reasons. One is a smaller company. So it's a middle market company. Um, the department was small. It's only myself and my boss, Denise Schlitt. Um, and so we had an opportunity. So I had an opportunity to touch a little bit of everything um, because it was just the two of us. And so I got to see, prop- I had to get to do property and casualty and FinPro and, you know, all the different lines of coverage. And it was a very flat organization. So I got to work with the general counsel and the CEO and the CFO and really understand and dig into the inner workings of risk management as it impacts an organization at large. And so that was really, really good training because you lift and shift that into a bigger company. um, And it was tremendously valuable. I've seen that. And and I've told people that about small carriers, Uh, same, same, same story. You you go to a giant carrier like nationwide, you'll be, uh, I did that for, for several years you'll be doing a very, very thin slice of, of the overall pie. You go to a exactly. small carrier, you'll have a chance to, to, to have your hands in a lot of different things because that's just the nature of it. So, so yeah, that's a wonderful experience to, to then take elsewhere. Right. You're acting more like a generalist when you have a smaller company because if you're only two people doing everything, then you got to, you know, you have to dig into the midst of everything. We didn't even have an admin, so I had to pay bills. I had to make, you know, I had to really understand how that works and, you know, Paying it all up front versus paying it monthly. What does that do to the interest? What does that do to, you know, opportunity costs? Just really fully understanding the impact of an entire risk management department on an entire organization. And then um, having an amazing person who was seasoned in her career um, to be able to really connect to an understanding. And she, you know, let me be involved in everything. So that was an amazing gift that I don't think I appreciated at the time, but in retrospect, I absolutely appreciate that experience. And then, then you, you, you took that to, to the, well, uh, interestingly, company. I, yes. Well, interesting. I've always wanted to work for Coke. I grew up in Atlanta. I literally, literally grew up in the shadows of Coca-Cola. My granddaddy was a huge fan of Coca-Cola, um, the products. And so for me, Coke, working for Coke was just like, you know, my eyes. I'm like, that's where I want to mm-hmm. do it. You know, I want to do risk yeah. management at Coke. For, and for, so, for those of you who, who have not spent a lot of time in Atlanta, it really is Coke town. Like, you can hardly get a Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> right? It, it's, it's, people look at you weird if you ask for, for a Pepsi. Right. Bar. It's like, you uh, want a what? This, this, it's like, this, this is like, like a Coca-Cola proud. We have not only the, the headquarters, which is a beautiful... Uh, building. We also have the museum. Yes. Uh, yeah. The, it, like Coca Cola is deeply embedded. Coca Cola and Delta, basically. Are yeah. Deeply embedded it is in, very in, in, deeply embedded in the culture of Atlanta. So, yeah. And just, I, I I didn't grow up here, but but uh, if, if yeah, if you grew up in in, in Atlanta, I can totally see how Coca Cola would be like where you want to go. Right. And so, um, but as everybody knows, it's difficult to get in Coke because everybody who grew up in Atlanta kind of has that. Not everybody, but lots of people want to be there. Um, and so it's very, um, it's highly coveted, you know, kind of role. And so I had that intention. And then anyway, at Earthlink, the CEO passed away and the company took a different turn. And so they had layoffs. And in the midst of that layoff, um, the, the universe just opened up to my will, I guess, because there were three positions at Coca-Cola in the insurance and risk management department that became available. And so when I got laid off, I literally decided that I was going to wait for Coke. I was like, I'm going to wait for wow. Coke to come. 
And um, because I was like, that's where I want to be. And so I, I worked my network from every angle I could, whether it rims, people I knew that worked at Coke and everything and you know, did my due diligence to get that opportunity. In the meantime, I had an opportunity to do some contract work through Jacobson, actually. Oh, <laughs> with interesting. The, yeah, it's with the state of Georgia. Um, I was so, um, so hired. For, for, for those of you new to Profiles in Risk, that is what I do in my day job. I sell <laughs> exactly that service. Uh, so I, I sell contractors to insurance companies. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so now you know. Through, through Jacobson. <laughs> yeah, it's through Jacobson. So y'all worked as the um as the provider for the state of Georgia. And so um you probably weren't in Atlanta at the time, but there's a tornado yeah. that happened in the middle of downtown Atlanta, literally right after a big basketball game, and it tore up a bunch of buildings that were like state buildings down there. And so they were looking for somebody to come on and help them out with the claims and different you know aspects of managing that and some other projects that they had going on. So I met this. I met the director of risk at a uh, at a Rims event. Rims is amazing. Um, and so at a Rims event, and she said, "We need some help, but we're not hiring full time." I said, "Great, because I'm not looking for a full time job. I just need a job." <laughs> and so Coke calls me, and she was like, "Oh, that's you're very confident." I was like, "Yeah, I'll be here." And so Coke calls me. When Coke calls me, I'm out. <laughs> and she was just like, "Well, okay, you know, thanks for telling me up front." So I went to work for the state of Georgia. That was, you know, very. I've always done nonprofit philanthropy work because I like the way it feels. Okay. So working for the state of Georgia was a beautiful intersection of doing what I love to do, risk management and insurance work, what I'm trained to do, but also giving back to my state and giving, I feeling like it was, even though I was getting paid for it, it felt very philanthropic because I felt like what I'm doing is actually impacting people in my community in a significant kind of way. And so that was a beautiful experience, a beautiful intersection of um, understanding. And so I really enjoyed my time there, really did. And then Coke called me. (laughs) And when Coke called, I went to work for Coke and it wasn't Mother Coke, which is like the big company where you see the big um, building downtown or North Avenue, I went to work for Coca-Cola Enterprises, which was the number one bottler in the um, country at the time. And we, so, so, so even here in, in Atlanta, uh, like the bottler is, is not part of, of, of the mother company? It was not. It was its own Fortune 100 company within its own right. It had its own ticker yeah. symbol. Okay. Its own uh-huh. stock. Um, it it, there was some ownership by Coke for a small percentage, like less than 30%, I think, or right around 30%. But um, CCE was the ticker symbol, was its own company, its own entity. Um, it's, so I went to work for Coca-Cola Enterprising, again, which is the largest bottler, and their office was in Marietta. Well, it's an Atlanta address, but it's closer to Marietta is where their office was. And so I worked there, and then in 2010, Coca-Cola Company purchased the balance of Coca-Cola Enterprises brought it, integrated it back into the main hub. And that took me downtown to the Coca-Cola company's risk management department. So, so, so uh, I, I love the, the, uh, the, the, the confidence uh, previously of, of, you know, with the state of Georgia t- tell, telling them I'm here until Coke calls. So right. given, given that confidence, I, 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 I think that the way you should, you should, you should tell this story is and and, and then uh, the Coca Cola company decided they wanted me so bad that <laughs> they figured that the only way to do that was to buy the uh, Bend the narrative, to make it about me being amazing. <laughs> it, it, it was it was a Steve Jobs Apple situation. The, the, you know, that's that's how I would tell that story. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> So, so, so like Coke comes and buys Little Coke. Yes, Coke um, buys Coca Cola Enterprises, and it was um, it was they call it an integration, and so that's how it worked out. Um, that was an amazing. So at the time it happened, I was in grad school, so it was an amazing time to be in grad school. So I could intellectualize it and not really kind of get tied into the emotion of it because whenever time, you know, whenever there's a merger acquisition, there's a lot of emotions and uncertainty and people wondering if they're going to have a job and all these things. And so I was able to balance that by treating it as an intellectual exercise because I was in grad school. Um, And so it was interesting and it was great because you have these two companies that have the same under the same brand umbrella 
but two very different risk appetites, two very different margins, two very different concerns from a risk perspective because of you know their, their inherent exposure. And so it was very interesting. It, it was like a marriage of like, oh yeah, we, we go together <laughs> and we're going to get married. But, you know, one has, you know, but having two different risk appetites and putting it together. And so that was great from a learning and, and experiential perspective. Um, lots of work in mergers and acquisition. So lots of mergers and acquisition work, um, which was helpful in me understanding that one plus one does not always equal two in the world of insurance, risk management, um, in the world of, you know, putting two companies together. Oh, uh, to- so as, as, as a fellow MBA and fellow nerd, acquisitions very often are one plus one equals 1.3. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's that's the always never work out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the perfect what equation. I, what I, never what, I, what I've never, I've, I've never worked in, a, in an M and A or an integration afterwards. It's just what I've read as, as a nerd is that they very rarely, actually, the synergies very rarely actually pay off. Well, as someone with a lot of experience in that, let me just tell you, it's very true. One plus one does not equal two when you're in the world of mergers and acquisitions, you know, and that goes across not just insurance and risk management, but it also goes across culture and it goes across intention because it may be the intention of the merger and acquisition to grow exponentially. And then you don't grow as much as you think you're going to grow because you're not really taking a lot of things into consideration that are going to move you backwards. You're only looking at the forward moving items, but you're not looking at the things that are going to temper the movement. And so that's very short-sighted, I think, a lot of times in mergers and acquisitions because they're driven by growth and not understanding um, that if you have a portfolio of claims that are, you know, expensive, that's going to impede growth in some kind of way. So I've enjoyed the analytics of thoroughly digging in and pulling out um, the realities of what one plus one is in the space of a merger and acquisition, and it's not two. <laughs> so that, that was still at Coke, right? The, the M&A work? Mm-hmm. That was at Coke um, because the major M- M&A was the CCE and the Coca-Cola. But then, of course, as bottlers move around, there's all kind of mergers, acquisition, integration activity. I mean, Coca-Cola is an amazing company. Um, but if you look at the 10K, you'll see, you know, four or five pages of other companies that are underneath the brand portfolio that are subsidiaries of Coke and, you know, lots of movement in that space. And so I had a lot of opportunity to work on quite a few mergers and acquisitions. Um, and it was, it was, yeah, it was very interesting. Very good experience. Okay. So, so why would you ever leave Coke? You know, a lot of people say that, like, you're at Coke? Why leave Coke? It's so great and wonderful. And you know what? Coke was great and wonderful, and I'm still a big fan of the brand. Um, But family, uh, life happens, right? So my little sister was in South Carolina, and she was having a baby. And um, we hadn't had a baby in the family in a very long time. We had lost our mom, and she so the baby would not have a grandmother, you know, on our side of the family. And so I wanted to be closer to her, to help her, to love on that baby. And I don't have any biological children of my own. So it was, um, it was a, it was a decision around family. Um, And Coke had, you know, Coke was amazing to me. And I, it was, it was, it was just a perfect time and opportunity to move. So I moved to Greenville, South Carolina and um went to work for BMW manufacturing plant, which was a whole different animal um, from the sheer size and volume of activity. Um, but it was a different, it was the same title, but it was a different engagement um, because at Coke, we placed the insurance, we placed the coverage and we told all the local operations, here's what it is. Here's what you're going to do. Here's how it's going to work. But now that I'm at BMW in South Carolina, like, okay, I'm not, I'm not in the decision-making space. I am now one of the locations that's being told what to do by the mother office that's over in Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now I'm getting instructions from Munich and 
of course, because I, I, was in the, I was in the hot seat before. And now I'm, I'm asking all these questions like, wait a minute, have you considered this? What about that? And, you know, they're looking at me like, well, this is how it is. This is how it's going to be. And I'm having to deal with it. So being on the other side of that, ooh, it was um, a lesson in um, patience, a lesson in, um, yeah, just it was, it was a different position to be in. Um, but, I mean, it was a good experience nonetheless. And the, the comparison that I make is, um, so I love the arts. So for Coke, it's like making a movie where you make the movie, everybody goes home, and you don't hear the reviews until later, you know, because, you know, your, your, your fans will tell you after the film is out. Whereas BMW was like live theater. You are there amongst the people that are impacted by your decisions. You're walking the halls with them. You're in the, you know, you're out in the shop and on the manufacturing floor and eating lunch with people who are impacted by your decisions every single day. And so that's more like theater. And so you either get instant applause or instant booze. <laughs> and that's a very different energy around work. And it's a very different thought process and intention um, because when you're in meetings, you're like, this is not impacting people that are in my imagination over in, you know, some other place. I'm not imagining it. These are impacting people that I see and work with every single day. And so it was very um, interesting. It opened me up to the people factor of decision-making and the risk management um, functionality um, in a very in a very interesting way. I mean, cause you're, you're daily confronted by your decisions. You're confronted by the impact of your decisions every day. Whereas yeah, at Coke, they, they, you're not. They start, they start being theor theoretical and academic and, and they become very, very, very practical. Exactly. Whereas at Coke, you're not confronted with the impact of your decisions because the impact is, you know, in a different time zone. <laughs> <laughs> it's, in two, yeah. it's in 206 countries. It's, you know, all around the world. And so you're not confronted with the impact. You may get a complaint here and there or, or a, a question here and there. But for the most part, people are like, okay, that's what corporate says do. That's what we're going to do. And they go forth with it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it was a very interesting transition. Um, yeah. so, so, so at BMW, at, at that point, did you basically fall in love with the people side? And, and that's where, where you're like... HR or coaching, basically? I have a heart for people in general, and I felt like BMW was the, the rounding out of my career perspective because I had like all of these other perspectives and it was just the rounding out kind of thing. Always, <clears throat> I've always wanted to do entrepreneurship and didn't know what that was going to look like exactly. And so after some thought and meditation, um, I've always done mentoring and career coaching in some capacity or another. I just didn't get paid for it. It was just kind of what I did and what I felt was necessary to help the next generation. Um, and so I decided to do it full time because it's the intersection of who I am and what I know. So initially I resisted it because I thought I put all this time and energy into a risk management career and a risk management degree. You know, this is where I need to be. This is the space I need to play in. And then one morning I was meditating and it actually hit me that, you know what, this is risk management. It's just not corporate risk management, but I'm managing the risk of people living unfulfilled lives. I'm managing the risk of people living unfulfilled careers. I'm managing the risk of people downshifting who they are and what they bring to the table and settling for less in order to, you know, feel um, significant in their careers. And so it is risk management. It's just risk management. It's the intersection of risk management and people and philanthropy. And so I said before, like when I was at the state of Georgia, it was the best of both worlds as far as the feeling goes. So with this is me giving me the opportunity to create the best of all worlds, who I am, what I know, my career experiences and all the things that I'm passionate about. I bring them together as a life coach and career coach. Um, so that's what I do. And I also do some consulting for small businesses um, because I think, you know, saving a big company millions of dollars is great. Saving a small company $10,000 is a game changer. And having that effect or that um, on a small business is amazing. And I love the way that feels. And I love having that impact. And then um, I teach the classes, um, pre-licensing courses for property and casualty as well. 
um, as an added revenue stream. And I love teaching. I love training. I love, you know, pouring into young people and helping them understand their possibilities in this industry. You know, it may begin with one intention, but it could be much bigger um, based on what they continue to learn and grow and understand about what's, what's possible in this career, in, in this space of having understanding about risk management and insurance and having that license under their belt. Like there's so many things they can do with that. And I don't think as an industry, we advertise that enough. Oh, we, we, we're, we're awful at getting the word out of, of the awesome careers within the insurance and risk management space. Absolutely awful. People fall into it by accident to this day. Yes. Uh, and, and even after they fall in by accident, they fall in by accident and we burn many of them out at the entry level, right? The, the, right. the, the big career call centers, the, the, the small exclusive agencies, uh, you know, where, where, where they hire people at 10 bucks an hour to, to cold call. Right. Uh, and it's such a hard job and, and not only such a hard job, but, but, but hard to figure out where to go from there. Um, I agree because people don't know what questions to ask or who to ask the questions to. And so I tell my clients it's so important to ask the questions in the right way to the right people in order to explore your possibilities. And so that's part of um, the benefit that I think I bring to my clients is helping them understand where the possibilities are. Because, I mean, let's face it, insurance is a multi-trillion dollar industry and it touches every other industry. So whatever you're interested in, whatever, you know, makes your heart skip a beat, you can go manage the risk of that thing and do well. Or you can go and be an expert in ensuring that thing and do very well. That, you know? Absolutely, everything. What, what I, I, I call that the 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 aviation underwriter or the aviation broker paradox. And I, I won't spend a lot of time here. I, I've done a ten minute video on it before. But basically, there, there's there's a kid out there who wanted to 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 uh, to, to be a pilot. Yes. Uh, and didn't make it because they couldn't pass the physical, right? Their eyes weren't good enough or, or whatever, but they're a giant nerd about uh, aircraft and, and, and aviation. Yes. That, is a, that, is, that is a perfect aviation underwriter or broker. The problem is that is, neither of those jobs are entry level. So, right, and not only that, like their uh, high school counselor is not gonna tell them about those, those jobs, right? They're so specialized. Uh, That's very true, but it's interesting. You can go to an insurance broker and work in the aeronautical department and be able to, you know, see how that world works and grow yourself into that. Um, that's over the course of my career, I've had responsibility for um, insuring um, airplanes. And, and let me tell you, my dad's a hobbyist um, pilot, and I spent a lot of time in high school in, you know, the small airport, airports, um, Peace Street Cab, Charlie Brown. And it's a whole different culture. It's very interesting. Yeah. So at the point yeah. that I had to ensure, you know, some of these business aviation exposures, let me tell you, that was the highlight of my career. My dad oh. cannot tell you nothing I do, but he can tell you that I used to insure airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> that's and all he knows. He makes that's sure the, that I've insured. That, that, that's the thing. Like, like, like anywhere in the industry, basically, yes. any, the, 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 not, not in the industry, anywhere in the economy, like choose something somebody out there is an expert in, in risk management, ma managing that, and somebody out there is an expert in ensuring that. Exactly. So, so whatever it is you're passionate about, it, it, you just need the right advice to help you get the right experience within insurance and risk management and mm -hmm. then help you find the, the, the right role. And it, it might be a two or three step process. Right. But there is a career here for whatever your interests are. There's a wonderful career here, 100% agree. Uh, yeah, and, and I tell people that all the time, like, you know, tell me what you're interested in, tell me what makes your heart skip a beat, and let's, you know, let's explore how you can then, you know, connect to the world of managing that risk. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing once they get to you, they've generally had two, five years of, of, of less than fulfilling insurance or risk management experience. So, so they, yes. they've already it got something not, to build from. That's true, but it may not even be risk management and insurance because I get clients from other industries as well okay. who are looking to pivot or do something more interesting or make more money or, you know, they're tired of working for the sake of making ends meet and pay the bills. and They want to connect their head and their heart in a mm -hmm. meaningful, fulfilling way. And so I look at their transferable skills. I look at what they're passionate about. 
and we figure it out. And sometimes it's a uh, um, career in the insurance industry or risk management, and sometimes not because my career, my career coaching um, transcends industry. And so I do what's called a skill will thrill analysis with my clients. And okay. we see, let's take an inventory of your skills and then let's see what you're willing to do because just because you can do it doesn't mean you want to do it or that it excites you. And then where are your thrills? What are you passionate about? What are you interested in getting exciting about? Um, because if it doesn't thrill you or excite you or get you motivated, then you, it's not going to be sustainable and you're not going to be fulfilled long term. Um, and so we do the skill wheels thrill analysis and we land on something that makes sense. Um, and so far, so good. <laughs> Everybody seems to be very pleased with the results. They, you know, keep me up to date on where they're landing and how they're evolving and growing. And I think when you're doing something that you're interested in, it's exciting about, you're curious about it, and your curiosity will carry you into um, success and increase the velocity of your success organically. How how, how long does it take, uh, like, for, for, for it to produce results? Are we, are we talking, like... Well, what is the commitment? Uh, one hour a week for for a month, or or the, like, how 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 long uh, do 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 you generally need the commitment for in order to, to to really be able to help people? So my sessions are ten weeks, and it's one hour per week, and that they um, engage with me, and then between weeks, I give them what I call life work instead of homework. It's called life work. <laughs> where they go for and they do um, different assignments. And all of these are um, custom designed based upon what their objectives are. And so it's typically 10 weeks and it's called intentional conversations. And um, it's very evolutionary, very custom and very, um, very interesting. <laughs> we okay, get good so, yeah, we get some good results for our clients. Okay. So, so if you are, uh, one of my insurance nerds and uh, one of the many, 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 many rather entry level have a job that you don't love. Or I, I also know a significant amount of people who, who are not entry level and have good jobs. They just haven't made it to where they want to. Uh, and you've had a career conversation with me, a chat with Tony, but you know, I'm only half an hour and I, I don't hold your hand through. I don't have time. I, uh, right. This is not my business. Uh, so if, if, if you do want that, uh, I'm trying to think of the, of the word, that, that, that white globe approach or, 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 or that comprehensive yes. uh, uh, approach or a holistic approach to, to, uh, to, to getting to the right place and figuring out uh, the right, I, I love that, that phrase that you used, the, the right, the right uh, was it brain, heart, or head, heart match? Yeah, head and uh, heart connection. Head and heart Exactly. So, 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 uh, that, that's, that, that's fantastic. And, and, and by, by the way, um, people often don't understand, uh, well, why would they hire a coach? Uh, and, and right. Uh, I, Michael Jordan had a, you know, shooting coach, yes. uh, right. Like, like everybody can, can, can improve and everybody can, can use some, somebody to, to hold them accountable and help them see that what they're, what they're not seeing. Uh, I, I myself, uh, during a difficult period of, of, of my career where I was struggling in, in, in my job, uh, in, in, in the job that I love and that I wanted to succeed in, uh, I, I, I brought in a, a, a coach to, to help me through it. And it was, it was super helpful. Uh, it, it wasn't for a transition. It, it was for, reinventing myself in the role I was already in. Uh, but it, it's definitely uh, very, very, very helpful. Uh, do, you, do you have, uh, we, have, we have maybe 10 minutes left. I, I, I'm wondering if you have any stories that, that you, any success stories that you could share. Obviously you can't share names and, and I'm sure that you have to anonymize them a little bit, but are, are there any like stories that, 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 that you can share of how people have benefited from, from, from the coaching service? Certainly. Um, so in general, coaching is just like you said, it's to get someone to see you um, and, and mirror yourself back, mirror your strengths back to you and then help you overcome um, your weaknesses by um, capitalizing on your strengths. And so that's the benefit that a coach will bring. And so um, I have a few success stories, but I'll, I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you too. So one young man was working um, in the mailroom, literally in the mailroom of a big corporation, and he was frustrated and didn't understand 
um, how he could evolve. He had gone to school. He had a degree. He had started networking and had done all the things that he thought he needed to do to, to move forward. And um, there was a few things just tempering expectation because sometimes, you know, what we expect from ourselves, what we expect from others is where our disappointment begins. And so he was very disappointed and frustrated by not moving up and not having understanding. But we, through over the 10 weeks we talked, a lot of it was his perception of himself, his perception of what was possible for himself. And then also he was networking and having lunch with people and chit chatting, but he never asked them for anything. And so it's like, well, like, how did, how do they know that you need something? And at the end of the day, I think sometimes, and he was a young um, professional, I think at the end of the day, sometimes we expect that all other people are going to manage and navigate us like our parents did, or like we did when we were in school, right? Because in school, every year you got it, you got promoted. <laughs> mm-hmm. The real world doesn't work that way, right? Uh, you- I, yep. I, I call it the, the, the A student conundrum. Exactly. Uh, like you're not going to always get promoted every single uh, year. I'm a C student, a uh, uh, proud C student, and I have career-wise, uh, there, there, there's a lot of A students in the call center where I started at Farm Bureau who started with me and are still there. And they're wonderful call center people. And they're just waiting to, uh, to, to, to get tapped on the shoulder. Uh, right. And, and I'm, a, I'm a C student and, and uh, I've, you know, had an amazing career uh, because I learned things like that, like asking, like networking and asking and investing yes. in yourself and not assuming that. So, so I, I hear you. And, and I, I love that story because you're, you're absolutely right. Like, like, like that, 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 that young man, you know, could have called me for some quick career advice. Uh, and I would have told him he was doing everything right. Right. You've got the degree, you, you, you're doing the networking, you're, you're, Right, you're already at a, at a company that has opportunities. Uh, like, like you're doing everything right, uh, and it takes that deeper dive to really figure out the piece that's missing. Right, and so when we unpacked his thinking and unpacked, you know, his perception, and we had some very interesting life work um, lessons because sometimes you have to try on a different posture to see the impact of it, and then realize, oh, okay, so this can work. Um, so anyway, fast forward. Um, less than two months after working with me, he got promoted to work in a permanent position in a, um, in the, in the perfect area that he wanted to work in. And guess what he did? He simply asked someone he had already been networking with about an opportunity and he got into the opportunity. Um, he is making 40% more than he was making in the previous position and it's a, a, before he was a contractor and now it's a permanent position. So he has like better benefits and making more money and more upward mobility and opportunities, more responsibility. His confidence is through the roof. I mean, just he, he's evolved as a person. Um, and my methods are very non-traditional. Like I don't just sit down and talk shop with people um, because sometimes you have to show someone something in a simple way and then lift and shift that perspective and apply it um, in a more strategic way. And so one of the things that I did with this client, we went to an art festival. (laughs) And in the art festival, we learned um, communication skills and connecting with people and looking people in the eye and asking questions because sometimes asking is harder for some people where it's like you've been trained not to ask just simply asking a question is difficult. So we practice asking questions. We practice exploring in a responsible way at an art festival. And then we, it was very casual, lighthearted and fun. And we took that and lifted and shifted it over into his work life. And it has been amazing for him to just apply that curiosity versus sitting back wondering, Hmm, I wonder what this is about. No, you get to explore it now by asking questions and, really getting into the crux of what's possible. So, um, so that's one that um, I'm always excited about and I still stay in touch with him. And he keeps me abreast of all the growth and evolution that's happening in his life. That, that is a wonderful story. Absolutely wonderful story. Th- thank you. That, yeah, I, I really, really li- like, like that one. And good for him for, for, for making the investment. 
uh, in in right like like trusting himself in, in enough to 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 make the 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 investment. Um, yeah, especially in, in, uh, you know, while while he was sitting in a, in a mail room. Yeah, he was like, you know, at that point where he was sick and tired of being sick and tired, he was frustrated. He was just like, I just, I know I need some help. And he was ready to invest in himself. And he, he not only about financially invested in himself, but he invested the time and energy. Um, because yeah, I, you know, you have to pay me to do what I do. But what's more important is that people really invest the time and energy, you know, because I can tell you to do all these things if you're not showing up and being present and engaging thoughtfully and intentionally, then you're wasting your time and money. And so I tell people, you know, when you're ready to sign up, make sure you create space on your calendar, create space in your intention to really do the work. Because I'm the coach, I'm not your teammate. I'm not gonna do the work with you. I'm coaching you to do the work. You're responsible for doing the work and you own the outcome of the work. If it's amazing, it's because you did the amazing work. If it's trash, it's because you had a trash effort. <laughs> I don't own the good or the bad. You know, it's all yours. If it works out, it's it, it's it's because uh, they put in the work, and and if if, if it doesn't, it, right, then you you right. got to put in the yeah. Don't, don't waste your money uh, if you're not ready to put to put in the work. So right. that uh, that that has has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, we're we're kind of out of time here, but I am curious uh, if uh, we're recording right now, right in the middle of, of the coronavirus crisis, or maybe hopefully at the end of it. We're recording on May twelfth. Uh, how is it? Uh, what what does it look like right now uh, for 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 people lo looking right right now? What what ad what advice do you have for for people who are looking for for that job change or career change right now while the world is crazy? Well, lots of people are pivoting and some people are welcoming the pivot <laughs> and some people are like, you know, just kind of exhausted about it and they are high emotions. And so I would say um, that people need, you know, you need to, to get some assistance in order to manage and stay your emotions so that you're focused on um, capturing everything and every opportunity. And what I mean by that is that some people, times when you operate out of fear or emotion or desperation, you leave value on the table because you're just like, oh, I just want a job. I'll just take anything. But don't leave anything on the table. Don't discount yourself. Don't discount your experience. Don't discount all that you bring with you out of desperation, out of fear, out of emotion, because that discount is going to continue for down the road if you discount yourself now. And so... Um, I would say that people need to focus and not discount themselves um, when they're looking for new opportunities and and keep uh, keep the insurance industry in mind as an opportunity because risk, you know, risk management and insurance, they go hand in hand and the insurance is not going to stop. All the perils of life that happen are not going to stop. There's still going to be losses and fires and car accidents and all these other things. You know, life is still moving forward in insurance. And so people consider like, oh, I need an economy proof um, job or a pandemic proof job or whatever. Well, hurricanes are still happening. Tornadoes are still happening. You know, all these things are still happening. So insurance is still happening. So a hundred percent. It's a recession proof right. industry. Uh, right, so and the transition is only something like five days. Like you get a, in Georgia here, you get a 40-hour course, just five days, and you learn the property casualty, then boom, you get an insurance license, an adjuster's license. You take that, marry it with what you already have, and then you can evolve to a whole new career in the space of a week. And people don't even realize, like, it's super, is that, is that simple and easy. Um, and I teach those classes, so I know, like, in the space of a week, you take the class, you take your exam, and then you are now marketable in a different space combined with what you're already passionate about and already have experience in. Very, very true. So, El, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I will include the link to, to your LinkedIn profile on the show notes. Uh, awesome. And what, what is the best way to get a, to get a hold of you for, for any listeners that, that uh, want to dis discuss having you as a coach? So they can – reach me on my website and set up a call um, through my calendar. And the website is www.intelligentintentions.com. 
And they can also um, schedule a call with me through um, sending me a message from LinkedIn. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Uh, I'll include the link to the website on, on, the, on, on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for joining us today. Thank you for uh, having me. It's been great chatting with you, Tony. Uh, it, it, it's been a really good one. Uh, I definitely even learned some, some things. I'm not super familiar with the risk management side. So, so super, super interesting. This, this was very valuable for me. I'm sure it'll be very valuable for our listeners. So uh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you.